Hello there, welcome back to Fem Health Talk with me, Kellen Mudoni. Thank you so much for watching the intro video. And in this episode, I would like us to go back to the basics. I would like us to lay the foundation for upcoming episodes. We are going to explore the structure and functioning of the different organs of the female reproductive system. Did you know that one of the reasons why women are more vulnerable to infections of the reproductive system is because of how the system is structured and how it functions? Please stay with me to the end to find out why. Let's break down the female reproductive system into two components. We are going to look at the external female reproductive system or the external genitalia and we are going to look at the internal female reproductive system or the internal genitalia. I will minimize the video either to the left or right depending on the editing to enable us to appreciate these diagrams. I got them from Cleveland Clinic. They are medically and anatomically correct diagrams or images of the female reproductive system. Great! Let us start with the external genitalia. Uh, I'm going to discuss them from the top to the bottom, understanding the structure and the functioning of these organs. At the very top, we have the mons pubis. The mons pubis is a fatty layer overlying the pubic bone. On the mons pubis during puberty is where pubic hair starts to grow. The mons pubis again is prone to ingrown hairs depending on how you groom the pubic hair. It is also prone to these painful bumps that grow due to clogged hair follicles. We are going to talk about that in a future episode, understanding why sometimes throughout your cycle you will grow some very painful bumps. Some of them are even bigger in size and filled with pus and you do not know where they come from or why they appear. We will discuss that more in a future episode. Then we have the labias. The labias are two. They are basically folds of skin or the lips. Yeah, We have the labia majora or the outer lips and we have the labia minora or the inner lips. The labia majora um, are the outer folds or the outer lips of the genitalia. Their function is to cover and protect the internal genitalia. On the labia majora is where you also find pubic hair. And again, the labia majora are also prone to ingrown hairs and clogged ducts because they have a supply of oil that keeps the, the, the pubic hair, um, I don't know, I want to say moisturized, yeah? <laughs> right, um... The labia minora are the inner lips or the inner folds. They are thin and are hairless. You will not find hair on the labia minora. The labia minora also uh, function to protect and cover the internal genitalia and they also get lubricated during sexual intercourse. The labias vary in size, they vary in shape, they vary in appearance across different individuals and there is no standard appearance of the labias. Next, we have the clitoris. The clitoris is a very sensitive organ which is rich in nerve endings. Its primary function is pleasure during sexual intercourse. Fun fact, did you know that the clitoris has over 8,000 nerve endings, making it very, very sensitive? Finally, we are going to look at these three openings. They are very distinct in structure, in function, and they are connected to three distinct systems of the body. We have the urethral opening, then we have the vaginal opening, and we have the anal opening or the anus. The urethral opening is right below the clitoris and its function is to excrete urine from the body. It is connected to the urethra and bladder and kidneys and it functions to excrete urine from the body. So women urinate from the urethral opening, not from the vaginal opening. Next, we have the vaginal opening. The vaginal opening is the opening of the reproductive system. This is where the fetus comes out during childbirth. It's also where menstrual blood comes out during menstruation. It is also where uh, the penis gets in during sexual intercourse. At the opening of the vagina is where we find the hymen. The hymen is a thin elastic membrane that partially covers the vaginal opening. Its size and shape and elasticity varies across different individuals. The hymen naturally stretches or becomes thin or wears out due to sexual and non-sexual activities such as sports 
use of tampons and hormonal changes. The hymen has been subject to various social cultural issues. For example, in some cultures, the presence of the hymen is regarded as proof of virginity. Virginity testing practices were very common in some cultures. This is whereby older women uh, in the society would do visual examination, such as inserting fingers, inserting objects in a woman's vagina to check whether the hymen is still intact. Some communities also believe that a woman should bleed during their first sexual encounter, which is a sign or a proof that their hymen is still intact. If a woman is found out to not have an intact hymen, it would bring such shame to the woman. The woman would experience violence. The woman would experience such horrible stigma from the society and even their family status would be affected. Rather, they, it, it, it was sort of a dishonor to the family not to have an intact hymen. Like I said, the hymen thins out and wears out over time due to sexual and non-sexual activities. So it is very important to empower ourselves and society with facts and information about the reproductive health to avoid such practices. So let's sit back, gears. Uh, finally, we have the anal opening or the anus. The anus is the opening of the digestive system where the products of digestive system comes out. That is the feces or the poop. Do you remember at the beginning of the video, I began by saying that one of the reasons why women are more prone or susceptible to infection of the reproductive system is because of how it is structured and how the organs function. This is one of the reasons. The three openings, that is the urethral opening, the vaginal opening and the anal opening are in close proximity, meaning that has become barely from one another. So bacteria from the digestive system can find its way to the urethral opening, causing urinary tract infections. Again, bacteria from the anal opening can get into the vaginal opening, causing infection which is why hygiene in a woman is very, very, very important. We are going to go deeper into that in another episode to understand why we do not wipe from the back to the front. We are going to understand why we do not sit on toilets in public restrooms. We have a whole episode just to discuss female hygiene and why it is important. Now, let's have a look at the internal female genitalia. And again, we are going to start from the organs at the top all the way to the organs at the bottom. Uh, up there, we have the ovaries. The ovaries are two oval-shaped organs at the either side of the uterus. Their major function is to produce eggs or the ova during ovulation and to secrete hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, the hormones regulate the menstrual cycle and are also responsible for uh, secondary sexual characteristics in women. Fun fact, did you know that a baby girl is born with all the eggs or all the ova in her ovaries? There are no new ova that grow or develop over time. A baby girl is born with around 1 to 2 million eggs or ova. The eggs are usually immature or what we refer to as oocytes. At puberty, only around 300,000 to 400,000 eggs are left. The rest just degenerate and die naturally. So due to the influence of uh, estrogen and progesterone during puberty, the eggs now start to mature every month and one is usually released in the process of ovulation. So in a woman's entire reproductive age, only 300 to 400 mature eggs are produced. That is one each month. So what happens to all other eggs? They just degenerate or die naturally. And we are going to dive deep in this topic when we are going to be talking about fertility and menopause. Because by the time a woman gets to menopause, there are usually very few or no viable eggs are left in the ovaries. Next, we have the fallopian tubes or the oviducts. These are a pair of thin tubes that connect the ovaries to the uterus. Their main purpose is to allow the passage of the ova from the uh, ovaries to the uterus. The fallopian tube provides the site for fertilization. When a sperm 
uh, swims and makes its way into the uterus and gets to the fallopian tube this is where fertilization takes place and then the fertilized egg or the zygote uh, now is transported for implantation on the uterus sometimes implantation happens on the fallopian tubes as opposed to the uterus causing what we call an ectopic pregnancy and we are going to dive deep into ectopic pregnancies and how they happen in a future episode Next, we have the uterus or the womb. The uterus is a pear-shaped hollow organ. It has three major layers that I would like us to discuss. The innermost layer is called the endometrium. This is the layer where implantation happens and it also nourishes the fetus. The endometrium sheds during menstruation. The middle layer of the uterus is called the myometrium. The myometrium is the muscular layer. The myometrium is one of the strongest muscles in the body. It is able to expand to accommodate um, the fetus. It is able to contract, uh, generating intense pressure to enable childbirth. It also contracts to also enable the endometrium wall to shed during menstruation. The outer layer of the uterus is called the perimetrium. It just provides structural protection. Next, we have the cervix. The cervix is the lower portion of the uterus. It is around two to three centimeters long. It has an opening called the cervical opening. So during childbirth, the cervical opening opens to around 10 centimeters to allow for childbirth. So we are going to be talking more about the cervix in our future episode to understand why women are advised to go for pap smears to detect cervical cancer. Finally, we have the vagina. The vagina is a muscular elastic tube that starts from the cervix to the vaginal opening. The vagina environment is acidic, which means it has a pH of around 3.8 to 4.5. This inhibits the growth of harmful bacteria. There is that healthy, normal bacteria that is in the vagina. So the disruption of the vaginal pH can lead to infections. The vagina is naturally self-cleansing meaning that it is able to remove the dead cells, the bacteria, and the mucus as discharge. We will dive deep into understanding the pH, how a woman disrupts the pH. We will also understand healthy and unhealthy discharge in a future episode. So this was just laying the basics and the foundation for future episodes. Thank you for staying to the very end. I hope this episode was insightful. Which facts? Did you find more insightful? Let me know in the comment section. I will see you in episode two.